Hello everybody, it's been a hot minute. I do apologize for my absence. Uh, today's video is very exciting. Basically this news was exciting enough that I figured I should probably make a video about it to unpack what's going on. Now, very high level TLDR, OpenAI has an internal experimental model that is a general purpose reasoning model. It's not a purpose built model, but a general purpose reasoning model that they accidentally got gold medal on the International Math Olympia. Now that is the most prestigious math competition in the world and they got gold medal. For, for, uh, for comparison, they didn't even place in the top, I think it was like, what, 800 or something a few months ago. <clears throat> now, the reason that this is important, so there's, there's a couple primary facts that make this really important to understand is number one, they were not aiming to get better at math. Uh, if you read the thread, I'm not going to read you the entire thread, but the TLDR is that they were experimenting with some breakthroughs on test time compute or uh, inference time scaling. So basically, you know, ever since the strawberry craze, Q star pr uh, craze, which led to 01 and 03, and all the other reasoning models that we have today, OpenAI has had an internal breakthrough that has allowed them to reason so much better that a general purpose reasoner is now better than the vast majority of humans at math. Now, I want to point out something. So there's a few other things that I need to point out here. So back in April, when OpenAI released their benchmarks for uh, 04 Mini, I said they had solved math. Now this was the AIM 24, 2024 competition. So, you know, I was being a little bit hyperbolic and I do apologize because sometimes I like to have fun, but some people interpreted that. They're like, Dave is crazy. He's, you know, saying like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I, I even got, I got my first uh, community note where Noam Brown at OpenAI said, no, we didn't solve math. I was like, oh my God, you guys, you hate fun. So anyways, I was being hyperbolic. It was on purpose. But my point was, is that they sat, they completely saturated this benchmark just a few months ago. And now, fast forward a, just a few more months, because this was in April, so April, June, July, so two months later, uh, two, full, two or three full months later, they have now almost saturated the International Math Olympiad. Now, what I said here was that they have solved math. Now, that was obviously being a little bit hyperbolic, but what I have been saying is that once you get to a point, a tipping point in benchmarks, you directionally know how to saturate the benchmarks. So historically speaking, and by the way, this predates large language models and generative pre-trained transformers. This trend has been seen for the last decade and a half, at least closer to two decades uh, in machine learning, which is when you go from zero to 50% or zero to 20%, you know that you are directionally, you've got like the rudiments of figuring something out. But when you see those big jumps, per particularly when you have a model that says, hey, you know, last generation, we were at 74%, which is, that's pretty good. That's like, okay, you know, you have you have gotten to the point where you're commercially viable, although typically you only see commercial saturation start to happen once you get north of 90%. But 01 and 03, and then six months later, you have 04, saturate that benchmark. Not only are you directionally correct, you know how to saturate that entire task domain. Now, as people pointed out, AIM, this benchmark is basically high school math or advanced high school math. Um, I know there's different opinions on it. I'm not going to stand behind, you know, any particular categoriz categorization or characterization. But the point is, is this is not the most prestigious benchmark. That's the primary point. However, they saturated it, which means that they were very close to mastering that entire domain. Fast forward to now, and they have now saturated, nearly saturated that domain. And this has, of course, happened faster than a lot of people realized. Okay, so you get the idea. So let's unpack some of the some of the um, uh, kind of reactions. So first and foremost, on I think this is this is manifold, not poly market. So on manifold, which is a prediction market, uh, where basically you bet on things that are going to happen. Um, so in this case, they said, will will an AI win gold medal on on the International Math Olympiad in 2025? Before today, at looks like three in the morning, the chances were at around 20% and now it's at 85 or 86%. So what this means is that nobody saw this coming. And the reason, the reason you, know, you say like, okay, what's the value of a prediction market? Cause I've, I've actually done a little bit of research into the value of prediction markets, uh, particularly when on the AI Doomer side, they 
often some of the doomers will cite their their track record at forecasting and and uh, betting markets saying, oh, look, I did so well. My team was the best at this. The point is, is that prediction markets are not infallible um, and they tend to to do better when it's an information rich domain. Uh, so what I, what I mean by an information rich domain is where there's lots of OS int or open source intelligence about something. Uh, so like one of the things that prediction markets did predict relatively accurate, accurately, at least the top performing teams on prediction markets, was that Russia was going to invade Ukraine. And they got it down to about the month that they invaded. Now, that was information rich because it's Russia. It's an entire nation. There's satellite imagery. There's open source reports. There's stuff on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter. So there was a lot of information to go on. But what this shows is that there was no leaks. There was there was basically not a whole lot of open source information to allow people to predict that this was going to happen. And when you read the threads from Noam Brown and Alexander Way, you see that it kind of surprised them as well. They were working on, they were kind of feeling around, just you know, looking on some new algorithms. And then they're like, hey, this actually kind of blew math out of the water. Uh, so those are a couple of the primary points that I wanted to bring up. Um, and hilariously, Gary Marcus, I think this was as of yesterday, um, where people are saying that Gary Marcus is now the, G the Jim Cramer of AI. So if Gary Marcus says something is not possible, usually within a day or a week or a month, he's proven wrong. Um, so he said basically that, that AI was not even close to getting a silver on the Math Olympiad, and then literally the next day that AI got a gold medal. So... What I want to do next is unpack, okay, what's the long-term ramifications? Because people will say like, oh, well, nothing ever happens, right? You, they'll say stuff like, okay, so what does this mean? You know, when is it going to, when is a robot going to make my coffee? When you have a general purpose technology like this, you're often not going to see the direct impact. So as an example, a general purpose technology, the most famous one is electricity. When electricity was first invented, a lot of people said, what can you use this for? It took a while to even invent the electric light bulb to say, hey, look, now we have a use for this thing. Uh, electric motors took even longer to invent and so on and so forth. So general, general purpose technologies take a while to really proliferate out and saturate. This is called technological diffusion, but also there's, uh, there's network effects and there's all kinds of things. But basically, we're still finding new uses for electricity. Likewise, we're still finding new uses for transformers. So when a technology like a general purpose technology has internal improvements, which this is an example of an internal improvement of, uh, then it expands its capabilities. And so this is where you start to activate those network effects where up until now, one of the best things that generative AI was good for was generating images. This, this image is very obviously, uh, uh, AI, gen uh, AI generated, it can generate images, it can generate text, it can generate music, which are individual artifacts. It can write some code, those sorts of things. But most of it is either text-based or multimedia-based. However, now that it is getting close to saturating math, math underscores and undergirds literally all of STEM. So if you're not familiar, STEM means science, technology, uh, engineering, and math. If you want to talk in first principles, first principles is always math. Uh, which means if you can master math, you can master things like quantum mechanics and high energy physics and those sorts of things. When Sam Altman and others say, you know, AI will be able to invent new physics or discover new physics, what you're talking about is theory. And uh, in physics, theory is almost entirely math. Now, obviously, you also need physical experiments. You know, LIGO is not just math and LIGO is the laser interferometer gravitational observatory. So that's where we were able to detect uh, gravitational waves. You do need big, expensive uh, experiments, but those experiments generate huge, huge, huge volumes of math. Uh, same as the LHC. It generates something like many terabytes of, of data per second of operation. And how do you munge that data? With a lot of math. So another thing, another downstream consequence of AI getting better at math is what is AI? It's linear algebra and matrix multiplication. It's all math. All of the algorithmic research that's going on, all the architectural research, all the reinforcement learning, fundamentally, at a, at a rudimentary level, it is all math. So as these models get better and better at math, it'll do the same thing to math that AI has already done to coding, which means that it raises the floor. So I was talking with my wife this morning, and one example is that when you have a technology that raises the, the, the basement, basically, or raises the bottom floor with coding, you can learn to code basically as good as a five-year veteran 
in just a few weeks now with the help of artificial intelligence. You can learn coding, you can learn cybersecurity, you can learn all kinds of things. Now that it's getting this good at math, you basically are going to have someone, uh, everyone is going to have a PhD level mathematician in their pocket that can help them with anything math related. So you, first what you're going to see is this huge broadening, this proliferation of math capability in the same way that we've seen lots of people learn writing and learn coding with the help of AI. Now, when you have these other capabilities, because remember, this is all one technology is adding all of these capabilities. That's when you really see the network effects of general purpose technologies taking over, because now we use electricity everywhere. This proves that we're going to see artificial intelligence literally everywhere. So one of the characteristics of general purpose technologies is that they are pervasive. So one of the, the first one that we already talked about is that they tend to inter, they tend to internally improve over time. Characteristic number two is that they're pervasive and character uh, and basically pervasive means that it can infiltrate literally every industry. And we're already seeing that. It's in education, it's in healthcare, it's in STEM, um, it's in military. So it's already everywhere. It's kind of a foregone conclusion. And I don't remember the third characteristic of general purpose technologies off the top of my head. I should probably memorize it. Anyways, you get the idea. So we're getting these these virtuous cycles, these compounding effects, these, these, uh, these uh, virtuous um, uh, compounding returns of AI that's going to help more people do one, it's going to help itself, but it's also going to help people do other things, uh, all STEM related. So with that being said, I want to write, uh, r wipe up, round up, wind up. The, there we go. That's the, that's the word I was looking for. I want to wind up this video by talking about my work on post-labor economics. So if you've been following me on Substack, I've been working on refining the post-labor economics framework. Um, so I've got two recent blog posts. This one is the main one where I have distilled post-labor economics into a six-part framework. Um, those six parts are the rise of automation, the decline of labor, power and social contracts, measurements and KPI, concrete interventions, and then life after labor. All of that is outlined in this blog post. And then what I'm doing is I'm, uh, I'm unpacking each of those six parts of the framework in its own blog post, and that's what I just published today, Post-Labor Economics Part 1, The Rise of Automation. So if you want to go check those out, feel free. This is the basically the practice run of writing the book, The Great Decoupling, that I'm working on with Julia McCoy. Um, so if you want to get a sneak preview as to what we're going to talk about with The Great Decoupling, um, please feel free to jump on over onto Substack and leave comments, leave questions. Um, the questions and comments and concerns that I get are actually very helpful so that I can understand where the messaging is working and where the gaps in the messaging are. Um, I send these blog posts to economists and other thinkers and policy experts and podcasts and those sorts of things. So any kind of feedback that I get is really helpful. And it's going to be really necessary. And the reason that I'm making this video is because when you see a leap in capability of a general purpose technology like saturating all math benchmarks, you know that things are really, really starting to pick up steam. All right. With all that being said, thanks for watching. Cheers. Have a good one.